Good afternoon and uh, welcome to your skin health and wellbeing event. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Nal Miller and I'm the McMillan Health and Wellbeing Coordinator for the South Eastern Trust and I'm based here at the Ulster Hospital. Before we start, for confidentiality reasons, all attendees today will not be visible to other attendees or panel members. But panel members are aware of those who have registered for the event um, and cameras and mics are not functional, so we won't be able to see or hear you. You will, however, be able to engage with the event and I'll explain how you can do that later. So what's today's event about? Well, from speaking with patients and their families, we've been told that whenever they've completed a certain amount or finished their treatment, it can be hard to know what happens next or who you can talk to. We recognize that this can be a difficult time and that there was a strong need for information and support, not just about the clinical follow-up, but relating to the issues associated with recovery, such as emotions, returning to work, physical activity, and travel, to name a few. So today's our way of coming together to remind and reassure you of all the help and support that remains in the system for you and how you can access this. Today's event will help you to learn more about follow-up, what to expect, who to contact, and when to do so. It's also an opportunity to find out about the information and support that's available to you during your recovery or living with a diagnosis. There are a whole range of supports and services out there who can provide guidance and help you to live well with or after cancer. And our service can help signpost you to them. You will see on the program that you will shortly be hearing from some of our healthcare professionals. We've pre-recorded these presentations, but our speakers are here for any of your questions. All questions can be sent using the chat function this can be found at either the top or the bottom of your screen, depending on what device you're using. See three dots. Once you select that, you'll be given an option to use the chat feature. Questions will only be seen by panel members and we'll answer any questions at the end of the event. We understand that everyone's journey is different, but there are common themes which emerge that affect people, such as fatigue, building your strength and stamina, building your self-confidence, and dealing with some of the emotional implications of having had a diagnosis. I think it's very important to recognize that you're not alone if you're experiencing any of the things I've mentioned, but it's also important to note that there is still lots of help out there. Today is really about taking the chance to review things, seeing if there are areas of your life that can be improved, helping you to take ownership of your recovery and self-care we're starting to put pieces in place that are going to help you live really well. So with that in mind, I'd like to hand over to our first speaker, Dr. Nicola Cook. Hi, uh, so thank you. Uh, for uh, taking the time to join us uh, at this Skin Cancer uh, Health and Wellbeing event and taking time out on uh, a Friday to come and listen to us. So uh, my name is Dr Nicola Cook. I am one of the consultant dermatologists working here in the Southeastern Trust. And my remit over the next 10 to 15 minutes is to give you a brief overview of some of the common types of skin cancers that we would uh, see uh, in our clinic, um, how we diagnose these and uh, some of the treatments that are available. So the three most common types of uh, skin cancer that we would see in our clinic are uh, squamous cell carcinoma, basal cell carcinoma and melanoma. So uh, these all arise uh, in different parts of the skin. So you'll see on the right hand side, this is a 3D uh, diagram of the skin showing you the uh, top layer, which is the epidermis, uh, the middle uh, uh, layer, which is the uh, dermis, and uh, the subcutis or fat uh, below. 
So uh, squamous cell uh, carcinomas, um, these tend to arise from uh, what we call keratinocytes uh, in the upper layers of the uh, epidermis. Basal cell carcinomas, these tend to arise also uh, from keratinocytes, but these keratinocytes are usually situated uh, in the very lowest layer of the epidermis known as the basal cell, uh, hence the name basal cell carcinoma. In contrast, melanoma, uh, these arise from different cells. These arise from the pigment uh, producing cells known as melanocytes. Uh, these are usually situated in the basement uh, or the basal layer of the epidermis. And these can spread uh, both up and uh, downwards, as you can see in the picture. Um, and this uh, spread up and down uh, is actually, uh, we actually measure this uh, when uh, we are uh, looking at melanoma under the microscope. Uh, and this is known as a Breslow's depth. And this is quite important uh, in terms of how we treat uh, melanomas. And I will uh, discuss that uh, in a little bit. So basal cell carcinoma, this is by far and away the most common type of skin cancer that we would see in our clinic. Uh, it accounts for about 8 out of 10 uh, skin cancers. These tend to arise in sun uh, exposed sites, so it would be most common on the head, neck, trunk, upper limb. These are generally very slow growing. It's estimated that uh, over a period of four to five years, that these will only increase in size by around a centimetre. So often they are there for a long time before people even realise uh, that there is a problem um, or something that needs to be looked at. Thankfully, basal cell carcinomas uh, don't tend uh, to spread to lymph nodes or other parts of the body, but they can cause problems in the site in which they arise. So they can cause problems with pain uh, or bleeding, or when they get to a certain size, they can break down in the middle and ulcerate. They can also cause problems if they're very near the eye uh, or around the lip or around the nose uh, with distortion um, or other functional problems. This would be the commonest presentation of a basal cell that we would see, which basically looks like a skin coloured lump uh, or nodule, which gradually increases in size, uh, sometimes has little blood vessels running over it. And then, as I said, can occasionally break down and ulcerate uh, if it gets to a certain size. Sometimes basal cells can appear as flat patches, as you can see in the picture below. Um, and you can see how this would be hard to distinguish between a patch uh, of this or a patch of eczema or psoriasis. And um, so uh, again, it can take people uh, some time uh, to recognise that there's a problem. Squamous cell carcinoma, this would be the second most common type of skin cancer that we would see. Um, this accounts for about two out of uh, 10 skin cancers. Again, these usually tend to arise in sun exposed sites. They're very common on the head, neck, uh, ears, lips, um, but they also occur in long standing non healing wounds or uh, areas of ulceration on the skin. And we do also see it in non sun exposed sites as well. Uh, these tend to appear uh, and grow more rapidly uh, than basal cell carcinomas. Usually, people will say that it's been there for a number of weeks or a few months. And the commonest presentation would be an enlarging nodule, often skin coloured at the base, but uh, usually there's a central crust, what we call a keratin horn. Um, sometimes we see these type, these tend to be more friable, with a little bit ulcerated. Um, they can be quite raw. And um, as you can imagine, these can be painful um, and they can bleed uh, at times. Unfortunately, with squamous cell carcinoma, Unlike basal cell carcinoma, there is a risk of spread to local nodes and elsewhere if they're not adequately treated uh, or left to grow. So melanoma, so as I said, this arises from um, a different cell. This arises from the uh, pigment producing cell known as the melanocyte. Uh, the incidence of melanoma has been steadily increasing over the last 30 to 40 years, and it's now about the fifth most common uh, cancer uh, in males and females and accounts for 0.4% of all new cancer diagnoses. In females, the most common site to develop a, a melanoma is on the lower legs. Um, in males, it's on the trunk, but we do see melanomas arising on all uh, sites of the body, including uh, even the nail. 
melanomas, um, some can uh, grow more slowly, some can be a subtle uh, change, for example, a, a slowly changing uh, mole uh, that becomes more irregular or more darkly pigmented. Um, or sometimes they can arise uh, more rapidly. Um, and we tend to see that with the more nodular forms where they can appear over a few months. Um, sometimes they don't always have pigmentation. Sometimes they can appear like a pinky red um, papule. Uh, unfortunately, again, with melanoma, yet there is a risk of spread to local nodes or elsewhere uh, if they are not treated or uh, left to grow. So why is skin cancer increasing? As I said, um, we know that it is increasing. It's, uh, the rates are four times higher than they were in the late 1970s. Uh, why is this? Partly because we have an aging population. Um, partly because we have a change in the climate, it generally tends to be better, more sunny uh, weather. We have more people uh, over the last number of years going on holidays. Uh, there's also been an increase in the use of tanning equipment. And in addition to this, it may also be that we are better at detecting uh, skin cancers. So what are the risk factors for developing skin cancer? As I mentioned, uh, increasing age, we know that the majority of skin cancers will develop in the older population, but it's certainly not confined uh, to this group. And we uh, do see all types of skin cancers uh, in uh, adults under uh, the age of 50. Excessive sun exposure. So uh, this is certainly a significant contributing factor to all types of skin cancer. Uh, that can be using sunbeds, it can be sunbathing, and that includes sunbathing in Northern Ireland, um, as well as sunbathing abroad. And uh, we particularly tend to see in people who uh, are outdoors a lot, either through work or outdoor hobbies, um, who've had accumul accumulated a lot of sun exposure over the years. Previous episodes of sunburn, we know that this does increase your risk of skin cancer. Um, and this doesn't have to be multiple episodes of sunburn, sometimes just one severe episode of sunburn. And we know that getting burnt, uh, particularly as a child, uh, can be particularly damaging uh, to DNA uh, and increase the risk of skin cancers. In addition, if you have a close uh, family history of melanoma, so if there's a relative, uh, an aunt, an uncle, a parent, a sibling uh, with melanoma, or uh, what we call atypical mole syndrome, and by this we mean someone who has uh, in excess of 50 to 100 uh, moles, uh, some of which may look large uh, or unusual, or if you yourself have lots of moles, uh, some of which may look large or unusual, uh, we know that this does increase your risk of developing skin cancer. Unfortunately, if you've had uh, at least one uh, skin cancer, uh, we do know you are at uh, increased, uh, slightly increased risk of developing others. And we know as well that if your immune system is suppressed, whether that's due to a, a medical condition or whether that's due to medication, uh, that this can sometimes increase your risk of skin cancer also. So how do we treat skin cancer? So firstly, this is, uh, slide is to talk about how we treat non-melanoma skin cancer. So by that, I mean uh, squamous cell carcinomas or basal cell carcinomas. Most of these we can diagnose uh, based on uh, the history from the patient and the clinical appearance uh, of the lesion. Uh, but if we are not sure, then sometimes we may take a small biopsy to confirm the diagnosis in the first instance. And that involves taking a small sample from the lesion and getting that looked at under the microscope. If we are happy that it's in keeping with a basal cell carcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma, or it's been confirmed uh, by biopsy, then the, uh, the usual treatment for the vast majority of these cases is to have it cut out, i.e. surgically removed. Uh, dermatologists will uh, surgically remove a lot um, of these lesions, but occasionally, uh, if they are particularly large or they're at a difficult site or we feel that they may require a graft, then we will refer on to our plastic surgery colleagues to have this done. In some cases where surgery isn't appropriate um, or the patient has declined uh, surgery, there are other treatment options. Um, such treatments might include uh, what we call a curatage and cautery. So this is where we scrape away the lesion. 
um, or uh, radiotherapy where you're given a uh, radiotherapy uh, treatment. Other treatments that we can use are a uh, topical treatment. So there is a cream called Aldara, or there is a form of light treatment called photodynamic light therapy. So the latter two treatments, the topical treatment, uh, the cream called Aldara and photodynamic light therapy, they are quite good treatment options for uh, the uh, flat uh, basal cell carcinoma. Uh, the one that I showed you that looked like a patch of psoriasis or eczema. Very often we will treat uh, with uh, these treatments as opposed to surgically removing these and we get very good uh, outcomes. Often people will require a period of follow-up in the dermatology clinic uh, after they have had their treatment and this will depend on uh, the type of tumour that has been treated and the treatment that they have had. So how do we treat melanomas? Uh, so first of all, um, if we see a new lesion or a changing mole that we think may be suspicious of a melanoma, we will remove it with what we call uh, an excision biopsy. So this involves removing the whole lesion in its entirety and a small uh, rim of normal skin around it, usually around two millimetres. So this is carried out under local anaesthetic and the picture on the right shows you the, 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 the usual way that we will remove these where we have the lesion. We remove a small rim of normal tissue and then very often we cut around in what I would describe the patient as an eye shape. Uh, that removes the lesion, we take it out, we stitch it back together again and I'll make it send it off to get looked at under the microscope. If this does confirm a melanoma, then uh, the treatment for that is to go on and have some more skin removed around the scar site where the melanoma uh, was taken from. And you may remember I talked about the thickness of the melanoma in the first slide. Um, I talked about how we measure that, and that's known as the Breslow's depth. And that's very important for melanomas because the Breslow's depth, or the thickness of the melanoma, determines how much uh, tissue we remove around the scar site. So for melanomas that are thin, i.e. have a Breslow's depth less than one millimetre, we usually re remove around a centimetre margin of normal skin skin around the scar um, and as the Breslow's depth increases we uh, remove increasing uh, amounts of uh, skin so you can see there for a Breslow's depth of more than four millimetres we might uh, suggest removing around three centimetres around the scar site but this will depend on the location of the scar and other factors. I just briefly mentioned sentinel lymph node biopsy um, this uh, is a, a, an investigation uh, where uh, dye is injected to find uh, the uh, lymph node uh, that uh, the melanoma would, the nearest lymph node that the melanoma would drain to. Um, this uh, lymph node can then be removed and looked at under the microscope to see, and this is really to see if there's any evidence of uh, microscopic spread of the melanoma to the nearest, nearest uh, lymph node. This is a procedure that uh, will be offered to patients that meet certain uh, criteria. So I'm not going into too much detail because I think the plastic surgeon may be talking about that uh, to you, but it was just to mention that. And if that's done, that's usually done at the same time as what we call the wide local excision. Some uh, patients, depending on the Breslow's depth or other factors, may need further scans, such as a PET scan or a CT scan. And occasionally we may ask for the input of our oncology colleagues if there has been evidence of spread elsewhere. Uh, and they may treat with uh, what we call immunotherapy treatments. Um, and these, these, these are, uh, I say reasonably new treatments. Uh, these have been around for a while now, but uh, they have really changed the landscape uh, for uh, patients with melanoma and uh, they have uh, significantly improved uh, prognosis uh, for many patients and um, it's a really exciting field because there's, there's more uh, and more new drugs being developed. So I've talked about the types of skin cancers that we see and I've talked about some of the treatments but really I suppose uh, from a dermatology perspective, one of the most important things uh, is to try and uh, pick uh, these up as soon as possible and as early as possible. 
um, and we know that prognosis uh, and management is uh, much easier in patients when uh, skin cancers are detected early. So uh, I just thought I would show this slide. Um, this is one of the uh, algorithms that we often uh, use uh, for patients when we're trying to um, ask them to monitor their own moles and, and, and for skin self-examination. So it's called the ABCDE rule. A stands for asymmetry. Uh, B is for an irregular or jagged border. C um, is for color. So if there's two, three, or multiple col colors or changing colors in a lesion. D is for a diameter. If a, a lesion is increasing in size, um, certainly uh, uh, more than uh, six to uh, 10 millimeters, or if a lesion is evolving. Um, there are some of the features that we uh, suggest that you watch for, um, and if you see them uh, to uh, get your GP to check out your mole. I would say that very often uh, we do see some of these changes in normal uh, moles, but uh, if you have any concerns at all, uh, it's really important that you get the checked out by your GP, and if they have any concerns, they will refer you on to your local dermatologist. Finally, just as well as early detection, uh, obviously one of the other key points is uh, prevention. Um, and as I said before, we uh, know that uh, sun exposure is one of the significant risk factors for most types of skin cancer. So I've just included this. I'm sure you all know this, but this is just uh, advice about taking care in the sun. So uh, some of the rules that we would use uh, for uh, sun protection is one, two, uh, wear uh, appropriate uh, clothing, so that may be a hat, sunglasses to protect your eyes, um, long sleeve tops uh, with adequate UV protection. We also recommend that you seek out shade uh, during the sunniest times of the day, which is often between 11 and 3 uh, p.m. And uh, also, uh, in addition, is to wear uh, sunscreen. So when you're choosing your sunscreen, it's important to look at the SPF. Uh, this is the uh, factor that protects you against the UVB rays. And we uh, would normally suggest uh, that you use an SPF 50. In addition to SPF, it's also important to look at the star rating on your sunscreen. Uh, this is the level of protection that the sunscreen will give you against UVA uh, rays. And uh, we like that to be uh, ideally a five star uh, rating. So uh, when you're choosing your sunscreen, look for SPF 50 and a five star UVA rating. It's also important as well to make sure that uh, you apply sufficient sunscreen to cover all the areas. That you don't forget areas like lips and behind the ear. It's also important to put your sunscreen on for at least 15 to 30 minutes uh, before you go out into the sun because it takes a little bit of time for the chemicals to absorb. And then uh, finally to reapply it every couple of hours, and particularly after you've been swimming or towel drying. So they're really key factors in making sure that you get uh, the best protection from your sunscreen. So my final slide uh, is just some useful sources of information and um, there's some really good websites that we use all the time uh, in our clinics. Uh, they have a lot of patient information leaflets that we would use and give to patients um, and uh, this is just uh, for your interest. So finally I'd just like to say Thank you for taking the time uh, to listen to me. I hope you find uh, some of that helpful um, and interesting. And I know that some of us will be available for um, discussion on the panel at the end of the session. Uh, so thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Cook, for all the information provided in your presentation. Uh, if you do have any questions for Dr. Cook, uh, please send those through and we'll aim to answer those at the end of the event. So you will now be hearing from Sheena Stuthers, our nurse consultant for skin cancer, um, and Sheena will be giving you more information about ongoing support.
Good afternoon and welcome to the Skin Cancer Health and Wellbeing virtual event. My name is Sheena Stuthers and I am part of the Skin Cancer Nurse Specialist team based in the Ulster Hospital in the Southeastern Trust. And today I want to talk about how you access your specialist team. Firstly, the most important thing to know is the type of skin cancer that you have had. And I know some of you will have had basal cell carcinoma, some of you will have had a squamous cell carcinoma, others a melanoma, and some of you will have had a Merkel cell carcinoma. So it is important to know the type of cancer that you have had, and also that you have some information regarding that, be it in a written format, or perhaps in some other format that suits your needs better. It is important if you know that, and if you do want further information, please do link in with us at the end of the meeting and we can certainly send that out to you. Or if you feel you want to access further information, please do link in with your Macmillan Health and Wellbeing Centre to get further information. Firstly, the most important things to check following skin cancer surgery are to check your scar or check your skin graft for any change in pigment any change in colour really in and around that area where you have your skin graft or your scar. And this is so important for you to be able to do this. And that means that you're working in conjunction with us in relation to your follow-up treatment and care. You also check for any new lumps in that same area. So check under the scar on your finger along it. And if you see or feel any lumps or bumps in that area, please do contact your team. You also check for any new lesions or clusters, as in the second photograph there, where you have the little black dots, which are outside of the scar, but also could indicate further spread of the skin cancer. Secondly, checking your lymph nodes is so important. I know many of you will have already been given information and advice in relation to checking your lymph glands. So it's so important that you know which actual lymph glands to check. So if you have had surgery in the head and neck area, it's important then to check the lymph nodes in your neck. If you've had a skin cancer on your arm, check the lymph nodes under your arm, in your axilla, in your armpits. If you have had a skin cancer on your leg, it's important to check your groin nodes. If you've had a skin cancer in your back, it is important to check the lymph nodes under your arms and in your groins. So if you're starting to check these, what is it you're actually looking for? So what you're looking for would be, a, for example, a pea-sized lump, something that moves along under your finger, under the skin. And it's important that you do get familiar with your lymph nodes and checking your lymph nodes maybe once a month. And then if you do actually have, so you find something and you do feel there's something of concern, you're able to actually pick that up quite quickly. And we do want to hear from you right away if you do find something like that. And again, we do have information booklets and leaflets regarding how to check your lymph nodes. The next thing that's important is in relation to your checkup appointments. So these are your appointments. So use that time to ask the questions that are relevant to you to get the information that you need. But what are we looking for when we see you at your checkup appointment? What we're checking for is what we've already talked about, any new lesions. Whoever's examining you will actually check their scar, they will check your lymph nodes. So we're looking for any spread of the skin cancer. We're also there to offer support if there's anything you need. And of course, again, any information or any education that you need in and around some protection, some prevention, or any type of information regarding what we've already discussed in terms of the type of skin cancer you had or the staging of your skin cancer, any questions that you may have, use your time well with your clinician to make best use of your appointment time and I know during COVID it's been very difficult for some people to have face-to-face -face reviews and I know in many areas we're back to that again but also in some areas and some teams it still is virtual consultations by telephone or by some other means so it is so important 
that we're all working together. If you're checking at home and we're checking when we see you, then it's so important that if there was a problem that we would pinpoint it at an early stage and be able to get you to investigation and treatment as quickly as possible. So if you have any concerns, who do you contact? Well, you check, first of all, you have a clinical nurse specialist, and I know most of you will definitely have a clinical nurse specialist, be that within the dermatology team, could be within the plastic surgery team, or even in the oncology team. You may know a CNS in each of those areas, depending on the treatment and care that you've had. So check you have the contact details for the CNS in the appropriate team if you have a concern. If you can't remember who it is and you know one of the names, contact them and we can all link in with each other and talk to each other if you do have a question or concern. Thinking about the clinical nurse specialist role, it's a very diverse role, but the main thing is that we are there to act as your key worker across your whole pathway. And as I've already said, that can change. The key worker can change, the nurse specialist may change, but most importantly, we're there to ensure that you get the right information and support and advice along your pathway of care. We do have advanced clinical skills, we do have advanced communication skills, we do have leadership skills and decision making skills, but most of all, we are there to help you if you do have any questions or concerns or anything you want to talk about regarding your diagnosis, regarding your surgery, your ongoing treatment, or anything beyond that from a support point of view. So if you don't have access to a nurse specialist, I would say that's not probably very common, but if you don't know the nurse specialist, as long as you know the team providing your care, then please contact your consultant secretary, or if you have another contact number, please do ring it if you have any questions or concerns. None of us are too busy to hear from you, that's what we're here for. We're here to answer your questions, answer your concerns, and um, it's so important that you know exactly who to contact if you have any questions whatsoever. So I really hope that you enjoy the event today. If you do have any questions, we will have a panel at the end, and we were certainly more than happy to answer questions that you may have. Many thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Gina. It's great to hear about all the support still available uh, from the clinical team. So we'll now be hearing from Helen Murphy, who is a cancer-focused counsellor, and Helen will be talking about being more aware of your mental health at this stage of your journey. Hello, I'm Helen Murphy, a cancer-focused counsellor. And today, I'd like to take some time to explore ways to look after your emotional well-being after a cancer diagnosis. There will be time for questions following the presentation. Cancer Focus provides professional counselling across the province in each of the trusts, as well as providing a range of other support services for cancer patients and their families. These include our Family Support Service, which is for children who have a significant adult with a cancer diagnosis, art therapy, bra fitting, and our free phone nurse line. Details on how to access all of our services are on our website. Our counselling service takes place in a one-to-one, -one, confidential, non-judgmental environment and provides a safe place to address the difficulties resulting from a cancer diagnosis and treatment. Recovering from cancer and its treatments is not just about your physical body healing, but it's also about allowing the healing of your mind, including your emotions. These are some of the typical responses which are often experienced very acutely on diagnosis and during and after treatment. A diagnosis can bring up a lot of uncertainties and questions. Why me? It brings new fears and anxieties about treatment and survival. Worry is normal, but it can take over. A diagnosis can bring low mood and sadness because of how life has changed, and it can be an extremely lonely place to be, as if no one else understands. 
The physical impact of treatment and surgery can result in self-consciousness and a loss of confidence. It's common to experience anger at the unfairness of the diagnosis, anger at your own body, anger at others, or at God. Any life changes we experience will need a period of adjustment. After a cancer diagnosis and treatment, it may be necessary to adapt with, to living with and managing a health condition. It's important to find ways to, to cope with uncertainties about the future. Patients face the challenge of developing a new sense of self, of accepting changes in their body or in their appearance. Patients may experience new sensations such as pain, numbness, fatigue, or the loss of bodily functions. And finding a way to navigate these very difficult changes is central to achieving a good quality of life. Patients may experience times when they feel very vulnerable at first diagnosis, when there's huge uncertainty about the outcome of treatments. Treatments may mean depending on others for care, bring feelings of helplessness or uselessness. Even when treatment ends, patients may feel particularly vulnerable without the safety net of review appointments and regular monitoring. A recurrence or a poor prognosis often brings more fears and anxieties. There are common psychological symptoms and problems. Worrying is at the top of the list at 72%. Feeling sad is really high as well at 67%. Patients often feel very nervous. Difficulty sleeping is very common. Feeling irritable, maybe as a result of not sleeping and having difficulty concentrating and have psychosexual problems. Cancer brings with it numerous losses. The impact on physical and social and emotional well-being, having to depend on others more, loss of identity when who you were before gets lost in the side effects of medical treatments and hospital appointments, loss of a role or employment, maybe no longer caring for family or no longer at work, loss of self-esteem, loss of trust in our bodies, and loss of life expectancy and at times loss of expectations about the future. The world can seem unsafe in a way that it never did before. When we experience loss of anything, we have a grief reaction and we mourn those losses. Cancer almost always brings about bodily changes and these can affect not just how you see yourself physically, but also feel how you feel about yourself and therefore how you behave. The physical changes can, can change how we view our bodies and our body image is connected with how we view ourselves, how we interact with the world and how we function. Our minds and bodies operate together. Physical changes also have a psychological effect and can lead to anxiety and depression. Low self-esteem from not being able to do what you used to do. Adjustment problems, maybe struggling to cope with side effects of treatment social avoidance, perhaps not wanting to cope with people's intrusive questions or gloom and doom attitudes. In extreme cases, there may be psychiatric disorders. Psychosexual problems may also be an issue. Cancer diagnosis and treatment affects the whole person, our bodies, our minds, and emotions are all linked. Many cancers and all current cancer treatments may cause sexual problems. Estimates show that between 35 and 50% of all cancer patients are affected. These percentages are higher in gynae, colorectal, bladder, prostate, and breast cancer patients. 
Talking to professionals can be difficult. 72% of patients surveyed said that their sexual relationship was affected by cancer and 66% of those felt unable to talk to their GP. This can be difficult for the patient and their partner because they may be unsure that the topic is appropriate. It may seem ungrateful or abnormal. It's not something we're used to talking about with professionals, or maybe they don't want to bother the nurse or the doctor. For the professional, it may be that they are personally uncomfortable with the topic, or maybe they don't want to offend, or due to a lack of training or information, or even a lack of time or privacy. And finding a way to overcome the barriers to talking through these difficulties can make a huge difference. Managing stress is important in everyday life in general. This is one definition of stress. Stress occurs when there's an excess of demands over the individual's resources to meet them. If you think of a set of scales with resources on one side and demands on the other, we have a limited amount of resources and we need a certain amount of stress to be able to meet deadlines or do exams or interviews, driving tests. But when it's prolonged or out of balance, then it becomes problematic. These are some of everyday stresses in general life. And they can range from something like having trouble with the car to going through divorce money problems, work issues, unemployment. And none of these stop because of a cancer diagnosis. So often the stress that cancer brings is in addition to these everyday stresses. And then there are stressors which are particular to illness. Pain and fatigue are stressful for both the patient and the carer, trauma, because anything perceived as potentially life-threatening is traumatic. Often the dynamics of close relationships can change, a partner can become a carer, or there can be a lack of communication between partners. Body image and sexual problems we've already touched on. Losses of health, body image, role, job, safety. Fears are also stressful, fears of a recurrence and about what the future holds and the vulnerability of when treatment ends. It can seem sometimes like being abandoned by all the medical supports during treatment and regular appointments. Stress affects us physically, behaviourally, emotionally and cognitively and all of these are linked. Stress is exhausting and tension can cause headaches and aching muscles. The stress hormones can cause digestion problems, a racing heart and sleep problems, and behaviour is impacted. We may withdraw or increase alcohol or food intake as a way of trying to cope. Our mood is affected, as is our concentration, and our mood can fluctuate between high anxiety and panic or low mood. Lack of sleep can result in irritability and short temper. And then the negative thoughts are also impacted when stress is around. So it's important to find ways to cope in the middle of all these difficulties. A cancer diagnosis is one of the most difficult life experience anyone can have to deal with and can be overwhelming. It can help to share your feelings. Who do you have that you can openly talk to about your feelings or situation? If you feel you don't have someone, professional help is available through your GP, other health professionals and cancer charities like Cancer Focus NI. Don't feel that you have to be strong and struggle on alone. Friends and family are important, especially at difficult times. Often patients feel they don't want to burden anyone close. And yet loved ones can feel shut out by a lack of communication. Get good quality information from reliable websites and organizations or from health professionals. 
keep busy, but not too busy, so that your mind is focused on other things and you're not dwelling on uncertainties. Set achievable and realistic goals. Start with small steps and build on these. Often this can be encouraging as you move forward. Plan rewards when you achieve a goal. Say well done to yourself and be good to yourself. I'm sure you're familiar with how important these are, how important it is to eat and sleep well. Your body heals and is refreshed when you sleep and also needs healthy nutrition. The advice is to go to bed at the same time every night, get up at the same time, have a bedtime routine where you wind down before going to sleep. Drink sensibly. Overdoing it may bring temporary relief, but it is a depressant and can lower your mood. It can affect your thinking and impact your medication. Be aware of your thoughts and how you speak to yourself. Often we can be harder on ourselves than we would be on anyone else. Ask yourself, would I speak to a loved one like that? Challenge negative thinking. Sometimes writing down the thoughts and looking for the evidence for them can be helpful. Solve problems as they arise and differentiate between what you have control over and what you haven't. Interests and hobbies help increase your confidence and interest and help you to connect with others. Make time for yourself. Chill out and relax. Ways of relaxing can include anything from music, pets, reading, crafts. Find something that suits you. Relaxed breathing is one of the simplest ways to relax your body and your mind. Imagine a balloon in your belly inflating and deflating as you breathe slowly in and out. Learn mindfulness techniques, prayer, yoga. All of these involve ways of meditating and this helps our minds to slow down and to be more in the present. Be kind to yourself. Encourage rather than criticize yourself. Treat yourself the way you would treat a friend in the same situation. You might be surprised at how different that can be. Many support groups and classes are online at the moment, but they are available through cancer charities and on the internet. And it can be a helpful way to connect with others who have gone through a similar experience. Professional support and help is available to you from the clinical nurse specialists and medical staff, your GP, through counselling, the psycho-oncology service and from Cancer NI free phone nurse line. Finding ways to live as much as possible in the present may be the best approach, although this is easier said than done. Living in the present moment takes some practice. So maybe start with living today. Ask yourself, what's important to me today? Yesterday has passed and no one knows what will happen tomorrow. Really all we have is now. And the more we live in the present, the better. A cancer diagnosis often makes people reflect on their life, reconsider their options make new priorities, make or create changes, and reconstruct certain aspects of their lives. It's important to remember that cancer does not define you. It's part of your life, but not your whole life. It may cause you to look differently at yourself and challenge you beyond what you ever thought possible. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Helen, uh, for giving us a better understanding of the emotional implications of having had a cancer diagnosis. If you do feel your emotional well-being has been affected as a result of your diagnosis and you'd like to speak to somebody about this, then please let us know and we'll get that organised for you. So you'll now be hearing from myself uh, about the McMillan Health and Wellbeing Service and the wider supports available to you. Um, and this presentation has also been pre-recorded. Hi all, so as you know now, 
My name is Nan, and I'm the Macmillan Health and Wellbeing Coordinator for the Southeastern Trust. And I'm going to give you a bit more information about the Macmillan Health and Wellbeing Service. We're a trust-wide service here for anyone affected by cancer. We know that cancer doesn't just affect the person that's been diagnosed. It affects family, friends, colleagues, anyone who knows and loves and cares for that person. We're based in the Macmillan Information Centre here in the Ulster Hospital. We have an information zone and a drop-in facility, and our service is here to help answer any questions you may have or get you in touch with the right person who can. We offer support not just to people diagnosed with cancer, but to the public and healthcare professionals as well. In our information zone, we hold a wide range of leaflets and booklets. We recognize that it's so important that you have access to reliable, high quality information, because lots of the information out there from Google or social media can be inaccurate, not relevant to you, and in some cases, actually quite frightening. So we hold all of the excellent Macmillan information and information from all of our partner charities. Our information is located in different points throughout the trust area, in each of the hospitals, in libraries, leisure centres and GP surgeries. You will see that familiar green Macmillan branding. We deal with a range of topics such as cancer awareness, living with and beyond, dealing with side effects, practical issues, information for family and carers, and information on local support. We hold the information in a variety of formats, such as large print and easy read, as well as other languages. We want the information to be easily accessible so that we meet all information needs. If there's something in particular you're looking for or need, just let us know through the chat function and we'll get that sorted for you. We understand that no two people will have the same experience and this will have been and continue to be very personal for you and your family. But we have found that these key areas emerge and that's where we would want to offer our support and guidance. Our team is part of the wider cancer services team and we're very much a catch-all one-stop shop to help you explore all of the supports available to you. It's a very efficient way for you to get support. So if you're finding there's anything you're coming up against or that you want to talk about, we want you to pick the phone up and have a chat with us. There's no deadline to our support, so you can come to us at any time with any questions, thoughts or feelings which may come up, especially as you reflect back on everything. At this stage in post-treatment, the areas we focus on more would be healthy lifestyle and physical activity, which you'll hear more about in our next two presentations, we also find that we hear about finances and work at this stage, and we offer work support conversations, which includes things like how to talk to your employer about your diagnosis, letting people know their rights at work when they do have a diagnosis, and how to plan a return to work so that it's successful. At this stage, again, managing side effects such as fatigue is another area of our support. And we also offer practical support for patients, which includes transport to and from appointments, advice about travel insurance, or even dog walking services. We understand that there are a whole raft of emotional implications that come with a cancer diagnosis. We find that it's not uncommon for people to feel quite emotional when they come through their treatments. Often, it's only at this stage you can stop and start to make sense of what's actually happened and understand what that means for you going forward. And exploring these emotions and feelings is also a very normal part of your recovery and moving forward. It can be a very hard step opening up about how you're feeling, but we do want you to reach out. Our drop-in facility operates on Tuesdays and Thursday afternoons from 2 to 4 and Wednesday mornings from 9.30 to 12 in our new Macmillan unit. We offer a one-to-one -one appointment which is staffed by myself and two support workers. Their names are Gemma and Nicole. We have an in-depth awareness of all of these supports and services available to you. There's so many, but we will talk to you, get to know you, and let you know all of the relevant supports available. And we'll signpost you to them or make referrals where necessary. 
we're very lucky. It's a lovely service to work for because it's a non-clinical setting. We don't have to watch the clock and we can spend plenty of time with you so you can tell us where you're at and how you're doing in order to tease out the, those areas that could be improved. Put some things in place that are really going to help build you up and live well going forward. If you have any questions, please get in touch using the information on your screen. Thank you. Okay, I hope you found uh, that information useful and are aware of the various supports and services available to you at this stage of your journey. So we're now going to be hearing from Janet Gabby, who is a physiotherapist in the Southeastern Trust, and Janet will be giving you all more information about physio after cancer treatment. Good afternoon, and my name is Janet. I'm one of the physiotherapists working here in the hospital. I'd like to chat today about physiotherapy after your cancer treatment, give you advice on how you can be more active after your cancer treatment, and just if you're suffering from side effects, which are becoming a barrier to exercise and where physiotherapy can help with that. The first slide we're going to look at is just on how to be more active. So this could include things like active living, walking to the shops, using the stairs instead of the lift if you can, just trying to add more steps to your day, recreational activities such as gardening, DIY, dancing, housework, washing the car. This can all count towards your activity levels. Playing with your children, grandchildren, if you enjoy any particular sport such as cycling, bowls, golf or running, formal exercise classes such as yoga, pilates and tai chi, um, swimming is excellent if you can swim and walking. Walking is the type of exercise that sort of is available you know, for everyone, no matter what your ability. So it's really turning your, um, adding more steps to your day and turning just everyday activities into active time and just really spending less time sitting. Do the exercise. Well, it'll help to reduce tiredness. It'll help to increase your energy levels. You may not feel less to begin with if you have never exercised before, but after four to six weeks, if you do exercise on a regular basis, you will find that will improve your energy levels. It'll improve your strength and your flexibility, so you'll be able to do more things that you enjoy. It'll improve your self-confidence. If you set yourself small goals and you're achieving those, that will help your confidence and boost your mood and help to reduce anxiety and depression. And especially if you try to engage activity with friends and family and the social interaction that comes with that will help to lift your mood. If you're more active during the day, this will help to improve your sleep pattern and also help to manage side effects of treatment such as hot flushes and maintain your bone density and also help with your weight management. Additional benefits then, Research would say if you're more active, this will help to reduce and delay recurrence or a second primary cancer. And it also will lower the risk of developing other health problems such as heart disease, diabetes and stroke. So what do we need to do? The government guidelines are that we should do 30 minutes or more of moderate activity most days of the week. Now, if you've never exercised before and 30 minutes seems too much, you can break this down into bouts of 10 or 15 minutes. Two of your sessions in the week should really be focused around building strength in the major muscles in the upper and lower limbs and working on your balance. Don't worry if you don't have any weights or fancy therabands at home. You can just fill maybe a small water bottle with sand or stones and use that as a light weight. Or you can just use your own body weight. For example, just sit to stand from a chair, stepping up and down off a step. And so it's really just about active living, adding activity to your daily routine and minimising the amount of time that you're sitting. Level of activity um, should we be exercising at? And sometimes the Goldilocks principle is something that you should look at. So if you went for a walk and the next day you don't feel anything, maybe you think, well, I could maybe do a wee bit more the next time. So that's it. You've no soreness, a bit cold, do more the next time. If you've went out for a walk, for example, and the next day you feel a wee bit achy, but the following day that's eased, that's just the right level for you. But if you are doing something and you find you're sore for the rest of the week, 
or for a couple of days, that's really too much. And you know then to do less the next time. And the mistake that some people do make is doing too much too soon. And then they say, oh, I'm too sore. I can't do that. And they give up. What I would say is just say, right, I did too much that time. Next time we'll scale it back a bit. And you want to be doing something that you can do most days of the week and you can get a consistent pattern of activity. Just a wee toolkit to think of, Emer is going to talk to you about the Move More program, the Macmillan Run. And um, Macmillan also have Get Active Move More booklets and DVDs. You can talk to your clinical nurse specialist or your physiotherapist. The leisure centres also run a 12 week leisure centre pass and you can get a referral to this scheme via Macmillan Move More program or via your GP. A lot of us have phones now, which are smartphones that can track your steps. People have smart watches again, or pedometers. And sometimes you can use that as a guide and try and improve your steps then each week. There's also exercise DVDs out there. Macmillan have one, but some of the other voluntary organizations have their own DVDs as well. And you can also have a look on the websites for advice and exercise, the NHS website, the Chartered Society of Physio website, have good information on exercise. You can go on to the Northern Ireland Cancer Network website. And if you go on to the Living With and Beyond Cancer section, you can see what's in your local area. And you also can go on Walk NI or the Cycle NI websites and see what local walking and cycling routes are in your area. The last slide that I want to talk about this afternoon is just your treatment side effects slides. Now there's a whole list of um, side effects here. Now, some of these may be applicable to you, some may not. You may have none of these, you may have some of these. And it's just to say, if, if you are having any of these symptoms that are a barrier to you becoming more active, do ask to be referred to physiotherapist. There's physiotherapists that specialise in these particular areas and your clinical nurse specialist can refer you if this is a problem for you. So if you have restricted movement in a particular area and muscle weakness in a particular area following your treatment, and that's a barrier to you becoming more active, do ask for a physiotherapy referral for specific exercises and advice for that. If you have particular bone pain that's not well managed or you're osteoporotic and you're worried about what exercises you can and cannot do, again, do ask to be referred to physiotherapy for advice. If you're suffering from urinary and fetal incontinence and that's a barrier maybe to exercise or even trying to leave the house and you've had a chat with your clinical nurse specialist and they feel there isn't a medical management for that problem and it's maybe more physical, the, the clinical nurse specialist can refer you to the physiotherapy pelvic health team then for advice and exercises for this. If you're suffering from breathlessness or have problems managing your chest secretions, again, do ask to be referred to physio who can give you advice on pacing your breathing through your exercise. If you suffer from peripheral neuropathy, which is numbness and tingling and pain in your hands and feet, and again, if that's a barrier to becoming more active, again, do ask for a physiotherapy referral for information and advice on this. And if you're suffering from fatigue and just general deconditioning and you just feel so tired that you don't even know where to start and you just feel that exercise classes and the Move More program is just a step too soon. So do ask for a referral to physiotherapy that can maybe start you off a little bit more of a gentler program to improve your confidence, and your own self-belief. And then after that point, then we can refer you on to Move More. And if you have lymphedema, which is swelling in the arms or legs, and that's not being managed or you're not known to a lymphedema team, again, do you ask to be referred so you can get that treated and get it under control. And that way, then it won't be a barrier to you becoming more active and moving around. Thank you for taking the time um, to listen to me this afternoon. I say, if you feel that um, you can't engage in physical activity because one of those side effects is holding you back, do you ask your clinical nurse specialist, GP or consultant to refer you to physio. If you feel, no, nope, I'm not having any major issues, I just want to give it a go, I want to be a bit more active, then do engage with the Move More programme and Emer will go on to talk about that after myself. I say again, thank you for taking the time to listen today. Thank you, Janet. Um, as Janet said, we'll now be hearing from Ema Hagen, who is coordinator based in Bangor. And Ema will be talking more about physical activity and cancer. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Ema Hagen, and I'm the 
afternoon, everyone. My name is Emer Hagen, and I'm one of the Macmillan Movemore coordinators. My job is to look after the physical activity side of your, your care and recovery. I am one of 11 Movemore coordinators throughout Northern Ireland. We have one coordinator in every council area. So you'll have everyone on the call will have access to a Movemore coordinator. Our role is to encourage everyone living with and beyond cancer to get active and to stay active. And it might be to get back into an activity that you've done before your diagnosis, or it might be to find a new activity that suits your needs now. We know there are huge benefits from being physically active, both socially and physically. Most importantly, we know that physical activity can help combat some of the side effects of the cancer treatment. Cancer related fatigue is a massive issue that a lot of patients will talk to us about. That on not being able to shift that massive weight of tiredness um, of post-treatment and going through treatment. Now, a lot of the research now does show that the more physically active that you can be, the less that fatigue will reduce. There's also great social aspects to getting physically active, getting back outside after 18 months of us all sort of isolating getting back outside, doing some walking, maybe back joining a group. My role in our Arts in North Down area is to encourage you to get as active as you can. It might not be um, within a leisure centre, it might be at home, it might be outside with the grandkids or, or children. Um, but we do offer some move more classes throughout the borough and across NI. All council areas will offer some different classes there be some outdoor walks, outdoor activities, indoor Pilates classes, circuit-based classes, dance classes, etc. We are really, really conscious that people are maybe a little bit frightened still by coming into to the leisure centre environment. But please let me reassure you that all classes are run socially distanced, masks are worn, um, and we have very, created a very safe and social environment for everyone to come back to the centres. Now that might not be for you and you have an opportunity to have a one-to-one -one chat with myself or one of the coordinators to discuss what you would like to do and where you would like to do it and move more is very patient-centered okay so we can talk about activities that as i said you've used you used to do or maybe a new activity that you would like to try and we can help you build a little plan to get you back feeling fitter stronger and healthier we know all adults across uh, Northern Ireland aren't active to the levels that they need to be. The recommended levels is 150 minutes of physical activity throughout the week and we know only 53% of the population in Northern Ireland can reach those levels. So I'm here just to encourage you, even if you're thinking about getting a little bit more active, even if we could aim to try to do 10 minutes a day of activity, it can be some housework, it can be going for a walk, a cycle, it can be going to the gym, it doesn't have to be something really really structured that you know you think that you have to be in a gym etc it can be at home and um, we now have online resources through move more and um, we have exercise dvds that you can do at home but we do also have the classes available and access to local leisure centers gyms and swims if you would like to get involved please contact me on 077 184434 I will be available at the end of the talk for any questions or answers. And if you're not from the Ards North Down area, please still get in touch with myself and I can pass you on into the correct coordinator's details. We are going to show you now a little short video of Move More and all that Move More represents and stands for. Just to make you aware, the video was made uh, prior to COVID. Um, so it was back in, in the times where, where there's no social distancing. So don't be alarmed. Um, but it's a good wee flavour of the, the patient's view of Move More, what the classes look like, etc. Um, and I hope you really enjoy it.
afternoon, ladies. Everybody fit and well and ready to get active? Yeah. Excellent. Let's get going. At present, 63,000 people are living with cancer in Northern Ireland. That means that one in two of us in our lifetime will be affected by cancer. Physical activity is often referred to as a wonder drug. It can help combat the side effects of cancer treatment. It can help reduce the occurrence of long-term health conditions and can also help um, reduce the chance of the cancer spreading and returning. We also know that physical activity and exercise is safe both during and after uh, most types of cancer treatment. I was diagnosed with cancer in December 2015 uh, with lymphoma. I was a very, very keen cyclist, very, very fit. During my journey, I put on quite a substantial lot of weight from 15 to 23 stone. I got involved with the Move More program simply because my wife volunteered me. I then went to the class, which I realised I wasn't on my own, and I never looked back. Move More Northern Ireland helps people living with cancer get active and stay active. Macmillan Cancer Support funds the project working in partnership with local councils, physical activity providers, health and social care trusts all over Northern Ireland to provide physical activity opportunities for people living with and beyond cancer. Ah, oh, we're burning this morning. Hands and feet together. That's great, okay? Uh, we'll just do three more and we're back to the march, okay? Let's go to the spot. Sometimes it can be hard to know when to start to build up your fitness after you receive the cancer diagnosis and that's where our Move More coordinators can help. Our coordinators can provide specialised and tailored support on an individual basis to help you get back to that level of fitness that suits you. Move More is not just about the gym or running marathons, it can be any activity that suits you and you enjoy. Well, I'm David and I was diagnosed with a brain tumour just over two years ago. We've come here for uh, exercise in the water which is very pleasant, much better than exercising in the gym I find. Uh, the water supports my weight and I uh, really enjoy it. We have David here in the pool and David's been swimming with, with us for about six months now. It's really helped his mobility um, and, and walking. It's not just about a gym, it's not just about classes, it can be any activity that you enjoy, it's about moving more. My doctor told me into the test for bowel cancer. I wasn't going to do it, and I'm glad I did. If I hadn't had the operation, I'd be dead now. I've been told that. I enjoy every day. I try and give back as much to Move More, to Macmillan. Friendship is absolutely fantastic with these classes. Taking the first steps can be daunting, but that's why we're here. We're here to make it easier and to make you feel like yourself again. This is going to be exercise for the arms. I try and make my classes as appealing to lots of people. So I, I don't want my classes to be boring. I want them to come along and have a range of different activities. So we maybe do a wee bit of chai me and to warm up. We could maybe do a wee bit of Pilates, exercise to music, um, even boxer size, and different activities. It's going to cater for everybody. But dancing does not at all feel like exercise because you're actually, you're concentrating so much on, on counting and following the steps. But certainly it does raise your heart rate a lot more than the, the chimey element of the class. You've been in the house so long by yourself quite a lot as I was ill. So it is again the social interaction and um, just meeting people who are similar. <coughs> It's, it's a boost to your confidence, really. I started the classes when I was about halfway through uh, 16 chemotherapies. I continued here whilst I was on radiotherapy as well. For me, I remember a lady saying to me, get out as much as you can when you're going through treatment, when you're feeling well enough, get out, be busy, um, stay active, and that's very much what I did. I'm Alison. I am actually a nurse in uh, the breast care unit in the City Hospital. Ironically, I was diagnosed with breast cancer in July. We send a lot of our patients out into the community not, and I actually didn't know what all Macmillan did. So, you know, whenever I was invited to come along to this, this exercise class, I mean, I, my eyes were opened that how much um, they support you and get you into exercise and you know how important it is equally meeting up with all the other people that are in the class. So 
Close the poles, just put the poles out to the front. Okay, okay so we're just going to rotate the left leg. Okay, and now the right Three leg. Three move more. Macmillan wants every person living with cancer in Northern Ireland to become and remain active. Finding the right activity makes all the difference. The support network that you have through the hospital or through Macmillan and through the friends that you meet at classes like this, it's that that gets you through. I move better, I sleep better, I eat better. Uh, quality of life just generally improved. Life with cancer is still life. We'll help you to live it. Hey, thank you, Ema. Um, as Ema said, there's a move more coordinator um, in each council area across the South Eastern Trust. So if you want to explore this further, then please let us know. Um, at this point, I'd like to introduce our final speaker, uh, Julie Dorian, who is an OT um, in the Trust. And Julie will be giving us more information about cancer-related fatigue. Hello, my name is Julie Dorian and I'm an occupational therapist and I work for the South Eastern Trust in the community. So some of you may have come across occupational therapy and for those who haven't, the process of occupational therapy is looking at everyday tasks to improve independence and quality of life. By occupations, we mean the ordinary and familiar tasks that we do every day that we take for granted until we become ill cancer, its treatments and the recovery period can affect our daily occupations. And today I am here to talk about cancer related fatigue, the cause of fatigue, its impact and most importantly, some practical measures to help continue those activities that are important to you. So have you ever felt like this? I'm sure many of you can relate to this picture. I'm very mindful that you've already sat through a lot of the slides and talks today and you could be experiencing difficulties with concentrating. I'll discuss some of the impacts um, of fatigue later, but it can be a very difficult thing to describe in terms of how we feel. And I suppose I just want to ask, you know, have you been able to tell anyone how you felt? There is evidence out there that people often suffer in silence and they don't mention it to their family, to their friends, to their doctor or their healthcare professional. But the evidence says that fatigue can be the most debilitating, disrupting routines and everyday tasks. So what is cancer-related fatigue? Fatigue can sometimes be confused with tiredness. And we would expect that after a busy day, we may feel tired and we go to sleep, that we wake up and we're fine. But cancer-related fatigue is different and it can be described as an unusual and persistent tiredness. It interferes with our day-to-day -day functioning and it is not relieved usually by sleep or rest. It's not proportional to recent activity. I remember one lady describing feeling absolutely exhausted and this was before doing anything and it was at the beginning of the day. And it can be very subjective so it's a very individual and unique experience and everyone will experience fatigue differently. Many assume that fatigue generally accompanies illness and recovery and as we said and therefore they don't mention it but statistically it states that 70 to 100 percent of patients are affected by fatigue at some point in their cancer journey. And it's important to know that it is a recognised medical diagnosis. And we will talk a little bit later now about ways on way, the ways in which we can manage it. So what are the causes of fatigue? You can see in this diagram that fatigue is a very complex system. And it's not only the cancer itself and the cancer treatments, but there are your emotional distress. It might be lack of activity or it may be problems with sleep. So how does a fee fatigue affect you? For some, you may experience mild symptoms, while others may experience severe symptoms impacting on the areas identified here. So physically, you might lack energy or you might um, experience shortness of breath even after a very light activity. 
You might even struggle to get up on bad days. Cognitively, so those are our thought processes. You might notice that you're slower in terms of your thinking processes. I can remember one lady describing having a foggy brain and really struggled to try and concentrate on reading a book. Emotionally, you might notice that you're more irritable or you're anxious and you feel very frustrated and more stressed. You might lose interest in things that you once enjoyed and you might feel more less motivated and you may feel sad or depressed. Socially, this might impact on roles and relationships with family and friends. You might feel too exhausted to go out and you begin to avoid going out and socially interacting with others. Your spiritual well-being may be affected too and you may question the meaning, purpose and value of life and you might even have feelings of hopelessness. So how do we manage our fatigue? So the key to managing fatigue is to recognise that it is a multi-dimensional problem. Therefore, it is most likely to respond to a combination of different approaches via the multi-professional team. So it's important to talk to your doctor, talk to your healthcare professional, talk to your nurse. They can help and try and work out the cause and how to manage your symptoms. It's important to treat any underlying causes and your doctor can check for any medical problems that can be treated, such as anemia, pain or depression, the non-pharmacological management of fatigue. And the remainder of this presentation will focus on this. And this is the practical measures of how you can manage your fatigue. So how can we cope with fatigue? So in this picture, you can see a child with a money box. And the idea is very similar to our energy levels. You can see the child putting all the pennies into the money box and saving them up. And when they open that money box, they have to really think very hard on how they're going to spend their money and what they're going to spend their money on. Energy is the same. You have to really think about what you want to use it on. So in order to do this, and you may have already ado adopted some of these principles of what we call energy conservation, the three P's, planning, prioritizing and pacing. So planning ahead, and sometimes this can be a challenge in itself, and it does sometimes take a little bit of practice, but some people find it useful to use an activity diary to plan their day and week ahead. Prioritizing. Again, this will be a very individual choice and what's important to you. So what are the things that must be done and what things can wait? And even think about what others can do. And I know it's very easy for me to talk about it. And being a very active and independent person, it can be very difficult to rely and ask for help. One lady I spoke to found it very challenging to delegate tasks to others in her family. She felt that perhaps they might think that they're very lazy or that she didn't really want to let them down. But when we discussed the challenges that she was facing in terms of her fatigue and her day-to-day -day management, family were very supportive and wanted to assist. So pacing yourself by pacing and spreading some of the activities which demand a lot of energy, those we call high energy tasks, we can learn to better manage our days and weeks ahead. You may be familiar with the boom, boom and bust scenario where you feel that on a particular day you might have quite high energies yourself and your fatigue is well managed. And then what we do is that we tend to cram a lot of high energy tasks in and what we notice then is that we pay the price in the coming days and you're fit for nothing so this is why it's important to pace yourself when we're planning and pacing remember to slot in rest breaks and also allow yourself extra time and think of ways perhaps um, 
in, in what you can do and something that you can do in a different way. So as an occupational therapist, we can look at ways together to help manage your day and week ahead. And sometimes it's a simple change in an activity or a small aid that can make a big difference. There was one gentleman that I worked with and he had a real passion for cooking, but he recognized that completing every meal in, in the day and throughout the day was just too demanding. And as an occupational therapist, I provided him with a perching stool in the kitchen and this allowed him to conserve energy and he was still able to continue his role. He also delegated some of those preparation tasks to his family and one family member became his sous chef and it just allowed him then to continue his passion for cooking. As an occupational therapist, we can keep into a good sleep routine is recommended. Keep into a routine going to bed and waking up at the same time has its benefits. While you might be tempted to sleep through the day, it can disrupt your sleep at night. There is some evidence that there are benefits to a short nap of around 20 to 30 minutes, but anything longer than that is not recommended. Exercise, which has already been highlighted, is one of the best ways to manage in fatigue. And in fact, some studies are show that avoidance of exercise and activity can make your fatigue worse. Your nutritional intake, so fueling the body, um, has its benefits. And this can be very difficult whenever you're undergoing some treatments and you have nausea or vomiting. But a dietitian can advise you if you have any issues. Stress levels. How can you manage your own stress levels? And this can be something very, very individual. For some, it's relaxation. There's many apps out there that people have found the benefits of. Finding things that are enjoyable and fun activities. Even talking to somebody how you're feeling can help with relieving your stress. Some people enjoy meditation, others complementary therapy. But like I said, it's an individual choice and it's something that you can only decide. So if we just put this all together and we imagine our body as a human battery, if you put a lot of demands on the body, then the energy in the battery will go down and you need to replenish it. So the demands like dealing with stress, family demands, the anxieties of the have to do's, household demands, dropping the kids off to school, recovering from illness and return to work. And even that voice in your head, those guilt, those, the, the guilt of, oh, you haven't got that done. So we notice that our battery then starts to go down. And what we would recommend is that you don't get to the stage of having a flat battery. So in order to recharge our battery, we need to think consciously of how we're going to supply it. So things like relaxation, having a good diet and nutrition, sleep routine at night, doing fun things, things you enjoy. It might be something that you've never done before. Exercise and activity. And as we mentioned earlier, the three Ps, planning, prioritizing, and pacing, and then setting goals. So in order to increase your energy levels, you can set goals, but it's important to be optimistic and yet realistic. And your occupational therapist can help you to do that. Resources available on fatigue. And if you would like further information, you can go on to the Macmillan website and there is information that can be accessed through booklets, leaflets and audiobooks and recommended apps. Or just pick up the phone and give us a ring. I hope that this information has been helpful. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Julie, for that information. 
Um, so that's the end of our presentations. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Louise Harden, who is our skin cancer clinical nurse specialist. Um, and Louise has been keeping an eye on any questions that have been coming through um, to panel members. So can I ask all panel members to turn your cameras on and uh, remain muted as you're answering any questions? Okay. Thank you, Nar. Um, so yes, we've had a couple of questions come through, um, and um, in particular, there there have been a couple of questions with regards to skin grafting. And um, so I was just going to start and talk a little bit about that um, in general, and hopefully, um, what I talk about will answer those questions. And then, if there's anything more specific, um, we can we can certainly address those questions as well. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to say that there are there are two types of skin grafts. Um, there's a split skin graft and a full thickness skin graft, and it's usually the split skin graft, which would be the most one that would be commonly used, actually, um, uh, certainly within plastic surgery um, for reconstruction of, of defects. Um, and they can have very different clinical appearances, and it can be a little bit unnerving um, as skin grafts do change, and certainly with their colour and their texture. Um, so I think that's what the questions were really um, in relation to. Um, so it's important to remember that skin grafts don't come with their own blood supply. So um, we're really relying on a healthy wound bed in order to help revascularization um, and good take of the skin graft really. Um, so uh, one of the questions was uh, specifically asking about um, how long we should keep the skin graft covered. Um, so anyone who's had the skin graft will already know um, that the dressing stays in place for five days initially. Uh, the patient will normally then come to the dressing clinic up here at the Ulster Hospital and they'll have their first dressing done at that stage. Um, so at that appointment, uh, we're really looking to see if the initial um, sort of, um, if we are seeing the initial signs that, that the graft is healthy and that it's starting to take really. Um, so the dressing will be removed. Uh, the first signs of it being healthy really, is it moving about? Um, does it look like that it's becoming adherent? Um, or is it moving easily? And also we're looking at the edges as well, just to make sure that the graft that has um, uh, been put on, if it's meeting the edges and it's, and it's covering the whole of the wound bed. Um, at this stage, the color will be quite pale. Um, we're not at this stage expecting that the blood vessels will have um, started to get established. So this is very, very early on um, in the healing process for skin grafts. Um, so at this stage, it's really important that we do keep a good dressing on. Um, specifically that question, I'm not sure if it was just at the initial stage, how long we keep it on, or in general, you know, um, should it be kept on for a number of weeks. But um, at this stage, we keep it in place and um, we need to be mindful that skin grafts are very fragile. They can shear off. So even um, just, just with clothing, with trousers or something like that, it can actually cause the skin graft to shear. So we would be mindful of that happening. And also it can become traumatized and um, and uh, be disturbed very, very easily. So yes, we do want to keep it covered and it can be covered for a number of weeks. So after that initial uh, dressing change at day five, it's very likely that the nurse that you see at the dressing clinic will then recommend either coming back to the dressing clinic again or for you to attend your treatment room nurse at your local GP surgery. And this could be maybe on a one to two weekly basis. Um, we have to bear in mind that graphs um, can, uh, they can be very fragile and they can, the recovery is very individual. It can be dependent, you know, on various different factors. If the patient has any underlying health conditions such as diabetes, or if they have any circulatory problems that can certainly affect the health of the skin graft. Um, and it's also very important as well to sort of maintain good nutrition so that you're, you're giving your body a chance to recover um, and for the skin graft to take as well. Um, but if you're unsure about the state of your skin graft or you're worried about the appearance, absolutely get in touch with the CNS and we can advise you. Um, we can bring you into the dressing clinic or bring you up to clinic to have a look at the skin graft. Um, at the beginning, we would expect that the skin graft does look pale because we don't have that revascularization of the blood vessels. But certainly um, as the skin graft uh, matures, we would expect it to become darker. Um, and that's because we are having that revascularization of the blood cells and that supply is beginning to be reestablished. So the skin graft can certainly become darker. Um, and um, in the initial phases of the skin graft embedding as well, um, 
we can see a little bit of shrinkage. So sometimes the graft can look like it has shrunk down and then the edges can become a little bit more prominent. And again, that is all in keeping with um, healthy embedding of the skin graft. However, bearing in mind, you know, we're very mindful um, that uh, any changes that you feel are different. So if there's a change in pigmentation around the skin graft, or you feel any new nodules around the actual edge of the skin graft that you would bring that to our attention just to make sure that there's nothing untoward there. Um, but yes, the dressing can stay in place for a number of weeks. Um, it depends on how well you're healing. Um, also, uh, we're mindful that infection can slow down the process of healing as well. Um, and uh, with regards to the donor site, pardon me, um, the donor site, um, that dressing initially will stay in place for about 10 to 14 days and we would leave that undisturbed. Um, it can be quite painful, the donor site, more so than the actual site where the, the donor site has gone on to. Um, so we would recommend that you, that you manage that and certainly get in touch with us if you feel that your pain is not managed with the donor site. But we wouldn't be disturbing that dressing for at least 10 to 14 days to give that the opportunity to start to heal. Um, it can feel like a burn and can certainly have the appearance of a burn. Um, and again, after the 14 days, we would normally then expose that site. However, if it is slow to heal, again, if you have other health conditions that um, sleep, uh, slows up the healing process, we may have to put a light dressing back on there just to sort of keep that area covered. Um, a lot of the time, the donor site is actually in the upper thigh. Um, and again, that can be... Um, subject to a little bit of trauma with clothing. So if you are having issues with the, the donor site healing, we would recommend a light dressing on there uh, until it's dry, until the area is actually dry. Um, I think I may have um, <laughs> addressed the questions there, just uh, what, what people had put into the chat box. Certainly, if there's anything that I haven't covered with regards to the graft, please do feel free to get in touch with your CNS. We're more than happy to see if you have concerns about your skin, particularly the skin graft um, and the appearance of it. But um, yes, it will change color. It may initially be pale. It will get darker as the, um, as the revascularization process occurs and that is all normal. There will be initial shrinkage um, and it can feel that the, that the edges of it are raised. But should there be any new nodules around the edges, or any change of pigmentation, then you should get in touch with us. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Louise. Um, so that's really it for today. Um, and we hope the message has been that regardless of what stage you are in treatment or beyond, um, that you're not alone. We are all here and we all want to help and support you. We understand that there are many implications to having a cancer diagnosis that there will be times where you need reassurance um, and when you need to talk things through. Um, so if that's the case, then please do get in touch with us. We are still here. Your team is still around you. And hopefully today will have given you some things to think about. So if you do need any information or have any questions, um, then please get in touch. And thank you for attending today. And thanks for all our uh, presenters uh, for being here too. Upon leaving the event, you'll be asked to complete a short evaluation. Um, your feedback will be greatly appreciated as we continue to develop these virtual health and wellbeing events. Thank you.